for worshiping with us on tonight. Our scripture tonight will come from 1 John chapter 4 verses 19 through 21. And it reads from the New Living Translation. We love each other because he loved us first. If anyone says I love God but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love God, we can see. How can we love God whom we cannot see? If we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. Our song tonight will be I Love You, Lord, today, led by Sophia Galvan. chance, Father God, to come before you. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that we can turn our hearts toward you. We thank you, Father God, that we love you and we bless your name tonight. We pray, Father God, that you bless us as we come to dive into your word, that your word will be made truth to us, that your word will be clear, your word will be accurate, and that your word will be relevant, Father. Bless us on tonight, Father God, that we will walk according to your will, and bless us, Father God, that we will run and take your word to other people, their lives will be changed, situations will be renewed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. I praise you. I lift you up. Ah. Uh -huh. 
Hallelujah to the Lamb. Why don't we thank God for Sophia Gavan? Amen. Amen. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. We're always excited when our youth and our young people prove themselves to be godly and to be worthy of all the honor that God is giving them, and they're giving God all the glory. Amen. So we thank God for Sister Gavan again. Amen. Tonight we're in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. We'll be looking at verses 26 through 21. Acts chapter 9, verses 26 through 20 through 31. 26 through 31. We know Saul is having some issues. Amen. I said Saul is having some issues. He's having some problems. Saul is having some problems. Acts chapter 9, verses 26 through 31. The Apostle Paul has not been named the Apostle Paul yet, but he is Saul. Saul is having some problems. Why is he having problems? Why, why is Saul having problems? Why is he having issues? First of all, what's, what's the problem that he's having? He's having problems. What's his problem? Anybody had any problems today? Just one? No one had problems today. Amen. So when we look at Acts chapter 9, we find out that Saul is having some problems. What is his problem? Well, his problem is that folk are after him for preaching the word of God. People, the Greeks, the Jews, are after him for preaching the word of God, for teaching Jesus the Christ. When we met on last week, we ended by talking about Saul making a narrow escape. He's making a narrow escape. To give you some background here, we realize that Saul was one who, who went about killing Christians. He killed Christians. He murdered Christians. He attacked Christians. Yes, he attacked Christians. And because he attacked Christians, then Jesus met him on the Damascus Road on his way to attack more Christians. Jesus met him. He met Jesus on the Damascus Road. And when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road, Jesus spoke to him and he became an apostle. Why is he known as an apostle? Why is he an apostle? Everybody's going to wake up here in a minute. Why is he an apostle? Because he was called by Jesus Christ and an apostle, as we know, the word means one who is sent, one who is sent. And so uh, the apostle Paul, whose that name is Saul at the, at the moment, he was sent by Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road. He asked Jesus, after light struck his eyes and blinded him, he asked Jesus, what do you want with me or what do you have to do with me? Lord. So he asks, who are you? What did you have to do with me? Lord. So that tells me that Saul knew who Jesus was. He knew who Jesus was. How many times you ask questions that you already knew the answer? Saul asked a question he already knew the answer and he even addressed Jesus as Lord. Amen. So when he got up, he made his way to um, to another city, and when he got there, Ananias was there, and Ananias met with Paul. Now, Ananias was reluctant. Why was he reluctant? Because Paul, Saul, had a history. Saul had a history. What was his history? He went about killing Christians. And so now this Saul is converted because he met Jesus. When a person meets Jesus, he or she is converted immediately. No baptism, no church attendance, no giving of tithes and offering. These things we ought to do, but these things do not save us. Saul meets Jesus on the Damascus Road. He's blinded by a bright light from heaven. He is blinded. He cannot see. He meets Ananias. Ananias prays for him. And once Ananias prays for him, the scales, substance like scales, the the shade fell from his eyes. 
scales. When I think about scales, I think about a fish and how we, when we clean a fish, we have to remove the scales. So the scales came from his eyes. Now he can see. Saul hung around in Jerusalem with the brethren and the pericope. He hangs around Jerusalem with the brethren and he's fellowshipping with them, but they even are skeptical. Why are they skeptical? Because Saul has a history. His history is that every time he met Christians, he would even pull them out of the church and kill them. Why was he doing it? Because he thought he was right. He was defending what was known as his faith. He was defending his faith of Judaism. And he would go and get a letter from those in authority, and he would pull them out of the church and kill them. And everybody knew his history. Everybody knew what Saul was going to do. And so they were afraid. So they're wondering now at this point, is this brother for real? Did his meeting Jesus even happen? Is he for real? Is he really saved? Has he really changed? Or is he just faking it till he make it? Or is he trying to get close to us so he can kill some more Christians? So everybody's skeptical. But then when they came to kill Saul, I'm in verses 23 through 25, they came to kill Saul. Some of the brothers let him down in a basket for an escape. So now the brethren who believe that he is saved, those brothers are helping him escape. Now let me just tell you, whatever you do will come back on you. So Paul, I mean, Saul was killing Christians. Therefore, people are looking to kill him. You reap what you sow. What you do to other folk going to happen to you. Even when you're saved. Even now that you met Jesus. I oftentimes give the analogy that my brother-in-law worked with Harris County Juvenile uh, Department. And whenever brothers found out that he was a preacher, these guys would go in and say, hey, Mr. Williams, I'm saved now. I met Jesus. He said, yeah, that means you don't go to hell, but you're going to jail. <laughs> Are you with me? So you have to pay a price for sin that you do. It, it demands a price. Paul says in Romans 6 and 23 that there is a payday for sin. There is a payment for sin. For the wages of sin is death and the, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So you got to pay for what you do. Every idle word we have will come into the judgment. Every thought, every word we say, every attitude we have will come into the judgment. That's why Christians have to clean up their lives. Watch what you think. Watch what you speak and how you speak it. Most of the time it's not what we say because when we speak, most of the time it's true, right? Most of us in the room, we are truthful in what we speak. But the truth has to be seasoned with salt, has to be seasoned with love, has to be sweet to the taste. What did I just say? I said, whatever you say that is true, it has to be seasoned and it has to be sweet to the taste. I know you can just come out and say it and everything you say is true. But the way you say it, many times it's our presentation. It's, it's how we say it. It's how we decorate it. It's how we, some people pride themselves and I don't, I don't sugarcoat anything. And that's why nobody's listening to you. That's why people don't want to be around you. Because sometimes you just have to be diplomatic with what you say. You have to be diplomatic. You have to make sure that you season it real well with a little honey, a little sugar. At home, I have to do it all the time. How many of y'all have to do it all the time? Anybody? Does anybody have to say it? Let me think about how I can say this sweetly. Nobody? No one? I'm the only one? I'm the only one that'll confess it. We have to season it really well. We have to make sure 
that we, we are not aiming to hurt anybody still, and we want to make sure that we season it well. So they let him down because the gates and the surrounding outlets were guarded. So they let him down in a basket through the wall. The wall had big wide openings. And so they let him down through the wall in a basket, in a large basket. We are verse 26 tonight, verses 26 through 31, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, verses 26 through 31. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. Look at Saul. Saul met Jesus. He's excited about meeting Jesus, so he want to join the disciples of Jesus. He want to hang out with the brethren. He heard that New Beginning Church has a men ministry and we meet on Tuesdays. So he is excited about joining this discipleship. He's excited about joining the brothers. He's excited. He considered himself even a disciple at this point. So Saul is excited. But they were afraid of him. Even the folk in church are afraid. I told, I told you all, I walked in the church, pastor called me. He says, hey, look, uh, we're having a revival night. I said, man, it's 5 o'clock. Well, it doesn't start to 7. I said, well, I'm going to rush home. I'm going to take a shower. No, just come on like you are. I said, look, man, I'm going home. I'm taking a shower. I'm going to be late. I'm telling you I'm going to be late right now. I go home, I get dressed up. I mean, I was casket clean. I was real clean. I was sharp. I was even, I even had cologne and deodorant on. I was clean. I walked in the door, and when I walked in the door, whenever you're late, you ought to sit down in the first seat you get to. So I did that. I sat down in the first seat, and when I sit down, these two ladies start grabbing their purse and start moving over. I didn't look like a criminal. I didn't smell like a dope dealer. I was clean. I just looked like a thief. But I sat down and they pulled their purse and they moved over. They just moved over. They were careful. They were real careful. They ran a, a worse chance outside than they did with me sitting next to them. So they moved over and they began to stare at me. And I began to stare at them. So after the church was over, the pastor had all the preachers and the pastor to stand, and he pointed me out and went, hey, Pastor Davis, thank you so much. You heard about it at the last minute. Thank you for showing up tonight. We appreciate you. Then they started smiling and looking at me. I said to myself, it's too late now. It is too late now. So after the church is over, God had it fixed it as so. That when we walk, when I walked up to shake the pastor's hand and, and talk about the great revival that, that you in the middle of, these two women were standing right there beside me. I said, Pastor, you know these members? Yeah, these are members of the church. I said, how long have they been members? Now, they can hear what I'm saying. How long have they been members? Oh, they've been here about seven years. I said, yeah. Do they treat everybody like they treated me? Well, what did they do? Well, I, they took their stuff and moved over and looked at me and, and snarled at me. But then when you announced me as a friend of yours and as a pastor friend, then they began to smile and I began to look at them like they looked at me. People, even in church, will not trust us. But we don't go to church for people. We go to church to meet Jesus. We go to church to see Jesus. In Acts chapter 4, the Bible says that the men who were coming to Peter and John and attacking Peter and John, they knew they could see that they had been with Jesus. We need to look forward to being with Jesus. And they did not believe that he was a disciple. The disciples knew that Saul wasn't a disciple. The disciples knew that he wasn't one of them. In the church, we have to entreat, we have to welcome people who are not us, who are not like us, who don't live like us, who don't look like us. We have to welcome everybody because it is God's house, right? But the disciples were afraid. And when you're afraid, you have a tendency to be careful. If you don't be careful, you will catch yourself looking 
away at the wrong time. I'm sure our antennas are up in this environment we're in today. Yes? We're watching everything and everybody. Even when we pray now, we're praying with our eyes open. We are watching everything. So these brothers didn't believe that he was a disciple. And the reason why he was treated this way is because of the way he had treated other people. He had treated other people badly. Now people treat him badly. Verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. There's always one that's a peacemaker in the house. That ought to be. Who's the peacemaker in the New Beginning Church? Any peacemakers in the New Beginning Church? All of us just alike. We're in our own little pod and we're enjoying our own little party and, and we don't want anybody else in our crowd. Is that what the New Beginning Church is about? Yeah. Are there any peacemakers? Are there any welcoming people? Are there any encouraging people at the New Beginning Church? Anybody? Yeah. Or do we encourage our type? Do we encourage our color? Do we encourage our culture? Or do we encourage everybody? There ought to be a culture of encouragement. There ought to be a plan to encourage people. We ought to be hospitable to everybody. We ought to be hospitable. We ought to welcome people. So Barnabas was the one who seen as the encourager here. It says, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road in that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus and in the name of Jesus. Now Saul got to prove himself. He has to, he has to, he has to give his own confession. He has to talk about how he'd been changed on Damascus. He declared to them that he saw Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He saw him. He had to stand up for himself. Have you ever had to stand up for yourself? Have you ever had to say, look, this is where God has taken me. This is where, how God has blessed me. And this is why I'm here today. He says that I saw the Lord on the road to the masters. I saw the Lord. I, I am now walking with the Lord. When you see Jesus, when you have an experience with Jesus, you need to walk with Jesus. It's time out for playing church. It's time out for no sacrifices in church. It's time for us to get down to the nitty gritty where the rubber meets the road and declare what God has done. And that's why we love him so. Amen. I have seen him on the road and that he spoke to me. He's trying to let them know that this experience that I'm telling you about is a real experience. Not only did I see him, I spoke to him, he spoke to me. He had spoken to him. He declared that he spoke to him. He declared that Jesus took the time. Jesus thought so much of me until he spoke to me. I want to tell you, Jesus thinks so much of you. He's willing to speak to you if you would listen. You are special to God. You are somebody that God really, really loves. He loves you enough to even speak to you. But with the fast paces that we live with every day, these fast paces won't let us have time to speak to God. We got to take time to let God speak to us and us speak to him. Have he spoken to you lately? Has he spoken to you today? Have you spoken to him? Has he spoken to you? He said he preached to them and he told them how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. He's having to continue to confirm himself. He has to continue to approve himself. He's having to, to continue to convince other men of who he is and how he has changed. One of the worst uh, practices they have in corporate America is that you have a self-evaluation. I mean, every year, I hate it with a passion. Every year they have a self-evaluation. Now we in church, we are, 
We are born again Christians. We are people of God. We've been taught all our life, don't brag on yourself. Don't approve yourself. Don't confirm yourself. Let other people speak well of you, not of yourself. How many people have been taught that? Don't, don't, don't you dare brag on yourself. But when you do a self-evaluation and you choose not to brag on yourself, you will not get that, that raise. You will not even be asked back on the team. You will not be one who would even be thought of for a promotion. You got to write up something big and make yourself look big. Right. Totally against anything. It's the worst thing I've ever seen in corporate America. You got to brag on yourself. You got to talk about what you did. You got to write down everything except when you went to the restroom. And you got to make it look like you didn't even take time to go to the restroom. You have to make it look like that you show up early, leave late, and you don't clock in while you're doing this work. That's what they expect. You got to constantly, and if you mess around and miss it by one sentence of what they're looking for, guess what? You just struck out. And it could mean $5,000. It could mean no more promotions. Or it could mean your whole entire job. So here Paul is having to brag on himself. You know the bad thing about those Self-evaluation, after you do your self-evaluation and what you write up, sometimes they don't read it and they have their mind made it up before you even write it. And they copy and paste. How do I know it's copy and paste? Because a couple of my last few evaluations, they had she, they had another guy's name, named Aaron or somebody, all throughout the evaluation. So I wasn't satisfied with mine. So when I went to HR, I said, hey, how is this my evaluation? And this is a supervisor that we go out to eat together. We do, do social things together. We hang out together. And then they'll tell you, well, we can't give you a perfect score. Well, have I not been doing perfect work? Have I not been going over or above? It's the worst thing they ever could introduce. Matter of fact, it's of Satan. It's satanic. It's devilish, it's of the devil himself. Paul is bragging on himself. He says, Jesus spoke to me and I preached boldly in Damascus. He's trying to turn their attention away from the fact that he saw the murderer. He's trying to make them see that now he saw the disciple. He saw one of Jesus' own. He saw one of the brethren. He says, not only am I one of the brothers, I'm a bold preacher in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's trying to make his point that I am so bold. I preach boldly even in Damascus where I was trying to kill folk. I preach boldly in Damascus. He had to prove himself. I declare to them that I I saw Jesus on the road and that he spoke to me and I preached boldly in Damascus and this is how I preached in the name of Jesus. He still got to prove himself. He said, I wasn't preaching that other stuff. I was preaching in the name of Jesus. I was preaching because I was called of Jesus because I saw Jesus and I stood in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem coming and going, coming in and going out. So he was hanging out in Jerusalem. I mean, Saul thought he had arrived. I mean, he thought he was there. How many of you have joined the church and you thought, wow, I got it. I have arrived now. I'm finally in the church. I'm finally getting settled in. And the Lord is blessing me. He's blessing my family. And now I'm going to hang out in Jerusalem I'm going to go in and out. I'm going to be a part of this congregation. I am. I have found me a new family now. We are family, right? We, we ought to be family. We ought to, we ought to show ourselves as family. We ought to uh, govern ourselves as if we are family. So he was with them in Jerusalem, 
coming in and going out. Verse 29. And he spoke boldly in the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus, boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Hellenists. But they attempted to kill him. Now here Saul is. He's trying to prove himself. He talks about how he spent time with the brothers and the disciples. He talks about how he was with them, how he, he boldly preached in the name of Jesus. He talks about how he, he has spent time in Jerusalem. He boldly, preached in, he boldly preached in the name of the Lord Jesus. And he disputed against those who were in power, the Greeks, the Hellenists. He spoke out boldly against them. But they attempted to keep him. The same folk that you hang out with is trying to kill you now. Some people say you reap what you sow. Some people say you can't trust him. Some people will say he's a brother. Welcome him in. Which position will you take? Where would you stand? Where will you stand when when the interchange initiative from Caravan Prison shows up and they seem with great strength and power, will you say, oh, they just have jailhouse religion? Or will you believe the brothers have changed even though they got chains on their body? Will you believe that they're chained? They got to prove themselves to you, huh? They still have some proof to do. So, so, Saul is still trying to run, having to prove himself. They still have him, even though he spent time in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the seat of religious. Jerusalem, the seat where, where they do all the religious activities. Don't you know that folk will kill you in the name of Jesus Christ? When we look at our governing bodies, people use the Bible to kill certain groups of people. People use the Bible to say that slavery was the best thing for African Americans. And they talk about it from the Bible and how they're protecting the religious rights. Yes? So, it was the same way during that day. The religious people, and to, to really point it out to you, it was religious people that killed Jesus. Religion is just a duty to perform. So people start going through the motion. They're just going through the motion, performing a duty. They do it like clockwork. And if you ever ask them to get off that clock, then you have offended them. If you ask them to do one little thing more than what they've decided, their religion wants them to do. Man, forget it. Have you ever seen, and this is no longer rhetorical questions, have, have you ever seen a group of people who follow the same pattern and they follow the same pattern that their parents follow and their, their grandparents follow and they do things the same way and they never know why they do it? They never look at why it's that way. They just continue to do it, continue to do it because this is the way we've seen it done. Why do we have a pulpit? Because we raised with pulpits. Why do we have chairs to sit in? Because we were raised with either chairs or pews. Why do we come to a building called church? Because we've been taught that we ought to go to church. Now some people have been taught that they ought to go to church, and guess what? They still don't go to church. Why do we go to school? Because we believe that if we learn more, we can be more advanced. Such it is with church. If we learn more, we can be more advanced. So what we ought to do things that are beneficial to the kingdom, not just because it's always been done that way. Back home, and when I was younger, if you walked toward the pulpit, there would be a gasp in the church. 
if you weren't a preacher or, or the preacher for the day and you walk across the pulpit, people, <gasps> don't do that. So that's why we don't have a pulpit here. We have a stage where everybody can walk. Because this is not the church at, at Jerusalem. This is not the synagogue where all these rules and regulations supersedes meeting Jesus. We have come to meet Jesus. We have come to experience the word of God, the living word of God. And a lot of things are just distractions. Can you name something that you grew up in religion that you know should not be available today? What religious practice do you know? Anybody? What religious practice that you grew up under and you knew, well, you know now, we didn't really have to do that? Yes, ma'am. Oh, holding your finger up when you're going out? What does that mean? You know what I think that means when you hold your finger up when you're walking out? You hold your finger up so you're saying, everybody look at me, I'm walking out. Because if you slowly move and don't be distracting, people won't look at you. But when you raise this sanctified finger, some people think, it tells me, hey y'all, I want y'all attention, look at me. I'm walking out now, I'm leaving before the benediction. I don't want the blessing of the benediction. I'm leaving. That's what it means to me. So when you see somebody with their finger up, they're walking out, first thing you're going to think is what? They said, look at me. I'm leaving before the benediction. I don't want the blessing of the benediction. You know, because there's a blessing in the benediction. There is a blessing in the midst of the benediction. And people just, just, Arbitrary, just I'm gone. What, why are you going? I got I, I left something on the stove. Well, then you know that you shouldn't be leaving anything on the stove before you left. Give me another. Give me another tradition that that uh, we've learned that we should not follow. Any other tradition? Covering the Lord's supper. Covering, the Lord's supper. Covering communion. Why did they cover communion? They cover communion to keep the flies away. We can't have flies in here because half of the congregation females will be gone. So we, 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 don't have, we don't have to cover communion to keep the flies away when flies are not present. What's another tradition that we grew up under that there's no need? Women wearing pants. I think I had to throw 90% of y'all out of here tonight. <laughs> women wearing pants. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that thought that women should not come to church with pants on? Is there, is there a problem with that? Is that biblical? It's not biblical? Is there a problem with it? One particular church that I know of, at one time, women couldn't wear boots. I think that's a that's a real long stretch. Women can't wear pants. Women can't wear boots. So when you talk about when you exegete, remember that word exegete. When the text speaks to you instead of you inputting something in the text, exegete is when you input something in the text. Exegete when you let the text speak to you. When you let the Bible speak to you. So when you exegete the text, you understand that women should not wear pants that pertain to the man. Men should not wear clothing that pertains to a woman. And if we enforce that, a lot of men wouldn't be around. Why is that? Because men either have studs or rings. I'm just convinced that they made the earring for a woman. But I'm old folk, right? <laughs> I bet you anything that when the jeweler was crafting that earring, he was crafting, crafting it with a man in mind. 
Yes? No? Now, when they make rings, earrings, they will want to make it for anybody that'll buy them because men buy them too. Say what? No, what I'm saying, yes. What I'm saying is, when whenever the jeweler was crafting a earring, he was crafting it with a woman in mind. But now, he's crafting it for a man in mind, a woman in mind, because men buying them by the grove less just like women are. Yeah, anybody got money? I mean, it's a good time to be a jeweler now. It's a good time to be a tattoo artist. Because when people are hit by the hurricane and FEMA gives them $2,000, they use it for tattoos, they use it for gold teeth, and they use it for earrings before they use it for food. It's a good time to be in business. And you do know that business thrive whenever there's a tragedy. Not one single funeral home has gone out of business that I know since COVID hit. COVID is a major disaster. COVID raises its ugly head on a regular basis. But as many funerals as funeral homes have had, you think they would at least lower their prices a little bit. But the law of supply and demand says the greater the demand, the less of the supply, the more it costs. It's a great demand for funeral homes now. It's a great demand for caskets. Necessity is the demand. You have to have a funeral home. You can't go out and bury your person. A lady talked about burying her, said that if you buried your loved ones in your backyard, then you wouldn't have to pay the taxes on the house. I don't know anything about it, but the fact of the matter is, funeral homes are filthy rich now. The more you see, the more comes up. I mean, they, they have satellite campuses now. They got one in every, every city, every, and it doesn't have to be a major city. And I spoke boldly, verse 29, I spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenics, but they attempted to kill him. They still wanted to kill him. Verse 30, when the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarshish. When the brothers know that you are a real brother, they protect you. That's why whenever there are men and children at the church, whenever there are women and children rather at the church, there need to be a man or two here. Because we have to protect the women, the children, and we have to protect each other. The Bible says that it is an abomination when you cause discord among the brethren. Discord among your family members and discord among your family in church. It is an abomination and God hates it. God hates it when you cause discord. We are here to protect each other. We are here to look out for each other. So we look out for other people's children as if they're our children. We look out for other people's wives as if they're our wives. We look out for other men, each other, because they are brothers. The Bible says right here in verse number 30. And when the brothers found out they were trying to kill him. They moved him around. They protected him. They moved him out of harm's way. They didn't say they ain't go over there. They moved him out of harm's way. We look out for each other. We protect each other. We, are, we benefit each other. We look out for each other so much so because we wouldn't want people to treat us like that. We don't stand back and say, it's good for him. He used to kill Christians. Let him have it. We look out for each other. We secure each other. We walk with each other. 
we stand for each other. They move them around. Verse 31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee and Samaria had peace. <laughs> and the churches were edified. Now they had peace for more than just Saul. Number one, they had peace because the king had died and the king wanted to build a statue of himself. He was leading the people away from God. So people were always upset. They were always upset. The emperor of Rome, he was always building something up for himself. But when he died and then Saul turned to Christ, now the Bible says the people had peace. The Bible says when the righteous is in power, the people rejoice. But when the unrighteous is in power, the people mourn. Saul is no longer a threat. Whenever you see somebody that is captured, that's a serial killer or a serial rapist, the people in the news come out right in the community, come out on the news right away, and they say, we can get a good night's sleep now. Because we were on edge as long as he was on the run. Now we can have peace. Now we can relax. A murderer is no longer on the street. The problem we have in Harris County is the fact that as soon as you lock them up, they pay a little bitty bail and they get back out. Just a, just a marshal, not even 10% anymore. They pay a little bit of bail and they back out again. So we have to understand that when the people are at ease, there's a reason why they're at ease. They're at ease because the emperor has died. The emperor of Rome, the leader is dead. The one that was taunting them, the one that was a hard taskmaster, he's dead now. And then on top of it, you have Saul that has committed his life to Jesus. Isn't that something? This murderer that got a letter from the priest that pulled people out of church and pulled them and dragged them, killing them, men and children and women, pulling them and killing them. He is now a Christian. He's one of us. We got peace now. The, the Bible says that the church throughout, the churches throughout all of Judea, all of Galilee, and all of Samaria had peace and they were edified. This word edified means they were built up. They had peace, brother with them. Oh, there's nothing like peace. People had cow king beds, but they couldn't even sleep at night. People who rode around in Rolls Royce wasn't comfortable at the red light. But now that the emperor is dead, and now that Saul is a Christian, now they have peace. And the churches were edified. The churches were built up. The churches were built up and edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Some things happened. The emperor is dead. Saul is now a Christian. And now the churches have peace. Now the churches are built up. Now the churches and the members of the church are walking in fear of the Lord. And they are walking in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And as a result, the churches multiply. The, they weren't just being added to the church. They were multiplied. Multiplied means you're adding faster than you were if you were adding. The churches were multiplied. People were giving their lives to Christ. Remember in Acts chapter 4, over 5,000 men came because of Peter and John's preaching. The churches were multiplied. They were built up. They were edified. And they were happy. They were at peace. They were at peace because Saul was no longer a threat and the emperor 
the governor, the president was gone. He's out of here. I got a feeling that the United States of America is about to get some peace. I got a feeling that some people is relaxing more now. I got a feeling that sooner or later, everything gonna be all right. Do you have a feeling? The songwriter said, I got a feeling that everything is gonna be all right. The threat is removed. The church can go on in, in the fear of the Lord. The church can move forward. The church no longer have shackles on it, on her. The church is built up. The people are encouraging each other. And the people are joining church. The people are coming to the Lord. The church is edified and the church is multiplied. And the only way for the church to multiply is that somebody come to know Jesus. People have to know Jesus. I mean, they were confessing a belief and a hope in Jesus Christ. They were being baptized. People were excited. They were shouting and praising God because the threat is no longer here. The only fear that I have now is the reverence unto God. I fear him. Dr. King said, I don't fear any man. I just want to do God's will. And when the threat is gone, the church no longer is bound. The only way for the church to multiply is that disciples come to Christ. The door of the church is open. Amen. This is an opportunity for another disciple, for more disciples to get to know Jesus. The door is open. The invitation is extended. You need to know Jesus. The Jesus that died for our sins. The Jesus that was buried in a barber tomb. And the Jesus that rose from the dead. You ought to try him tonight. His name is Jesus. The righteous son of Almighty God. If you've never confessed Christ as your Savior, this is your moment. If you would, bow your head with me and invite Jesus into your life. Just believing that Jesus died, was buried, and rose from the dead. Would you bow your head and invite him into your life? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you rose from the dead after they buried you in a borrowed tomb. I believe that you can change my life. Now come into my life and make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank God. We thank you for joining us tonight. We thank you for being a part of our service. Just remember that God has a way to edify the body to multiply the church and to give us peace. If you're not a part of the church, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the captain of the ship, where Jesus is the first and the last, where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. If you're listening and you are a, a person that wants to be a global member, members from all over the world, including Houston. Inbox us and let us know that you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church. We welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us. Please join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Sunday school. Join us at 10.30 a.m. for worship service. And also join us again on Wednesday night at 7.15 p.m. every Wednesday night for Bible study. Again, thank you for joining us. It is now offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gift.
If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle account. If you want to mail in your gift, you can mail in your gift to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Father God, we thank you for this privilege of giving. We thank you for blessing us and keeping us. Lord, we ask you to bless every gift and bless every giver. In Jesus' name, amen and thank God. Are there any prayer requests or praise reports? Prayer requests or praise reports. Prayer requests or praise reports. We will pray for Sister Ruby Poss and family. We'll pray for Pastor and Sister Davis. That's Pastor Matthew Davis and Sister Carolyn Davis. I'm going to lift them in prayer, along with all those who are all on, already on our prayer list. We want to continue to lift them in prayer as they are already on our prayer list. Also, remember our Bible listening and Bible journey, journey, journal, journaling, Bible journaling. Continue to Bible journal and listen to the Bible each and every day. We're a little over halfway there now. And so let's go. Don't, don't finish badly, but finish well. Amen. September 10th, September 10th, we will be celebrating Pastor Matthew Davis' 19th anniversary at the New Beginning Church. 19th anniversary, that is second Sunday, September 10th, right here at the New Beginning Church at the 10.30 a.m. service. Pastor Matthew Davis, uh, 10th, 10th, September the 10th, 19th anniversary. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank God for 19 years. Amen. 19 years. God has, has walked with us and been with us. Amen. Father, we thank you for these gifts. We ask you to bless them in Jesus' name. Are there any prayer requests or praise reports? Any prayer requests or praise reports? Amen. Prayer requests or praise report. We want to pray for Araya. Araya. Araya, which is um, Deacon Alfred's grandchild and Cherie's child, Cherie Alfred's child. We want to lift this baby in prayer. Araya, we want to lift, lift Araya in prayer. Um, she's a few days old, but we want to lift her in prayer. Amen. If there's nothing else, let us stand to be this Father God, we thank you now. We honor you. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you for another chance, another privilege to hear your word. We ask you to bless us, Father God, as we go forth and share your word. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to continue to walk with us and continue to allow us to be blessed by you. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for blessing us, for our obedience, Father God, for walking with you, for for the sacrifices we made. We thank you, Lord. We ask you, Father God, to add a double anointing, a double blessing to those who have been faithful to you. We ask you to bless in the name of Jesus. We pray for everybody on this prayer list, Father God. Bless us in our going. Encourage us, Father God, and, and bless us, dear Master, that we will be safe. Lord, we pray, Father God, for healing power. God, you are God and you're God alone. You are the great physician. You're the one who heals us and bless us. And we thank you for it. Now, Father God, bless those who are discomfort, who walk in despair. Lift them up, Father God, and bless their lives. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to bless Orion. We ask you to touch this child, this baby. We ask you, Father God, to heal her body. We ask you to give her strength and give her hope. Lord, we ask you to amaze the doctor, Father God. Blow the doctor's mind that none of the, the medical stuff will line up and they will know that God and God alone has healed this baby. Bless her now that she will rise up and be a missionary for you and tell men, and women, boys and girls about the goodness of Jesus Christ. Bless her mom and ask you to bless her dad. 
We ask you, Father God, to keep them strong, even in times like these. And, and bless, Father God, that this baby will remember this moment, even at a young age, of how Jesus has made all the difference. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing by sing. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are lifting, reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed.